ladies and gentlemen. Please rise for the entrance of the official party and remain standing for the national anthem and an invocation given by the Commanding General Staff College Chaplain, Sean Gee. Almighty God, we seek your blessing upon today's ceremony and everyone attending. We especially give thanks for President Truman's faithful service to this country during times of both peace and war. We recognize and are humbled by the fact that we stand upon the shoulders of leaders like President Truman, leaders that have gone before us modeling courage under fire, wisdom to shape the force, consummate professionalism, and a living faith that sustains a leader. As we reflect today upon President Truman's contributions and service, may we be inspired to be better leaders for our nation's sons and daughters. In your holy name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Today we are honoring the latest inductee into the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame. He is the 33rd President of the United States of America, President Harry S. Truman. Historians traditionally paint Truman as a previously unknown local businessman and politician. While many mention his service as a captain of artillery during World War I and commanding a battery in combat, few take note of his continued service as a reserve officer, where he was a division staff officer, commanded an artillery battalion, and eventually commanded a field artillery regiment. This experience helped shape his worldview, and it also assisted his rise in politics from Jackson County to Washington, D.C., where he was elected a U.S. Senator from Missouri and subsequently Vice President of the United States. Truman was actively serving in the reserves until his election as Senator prompted his involuntary transfer to the General Assignment Group. Having experience as a senior military leader effectively positioned him to lead a bipartisan congressional committee that investigated fraud, waste, and abuse in war production. Moreover, this experience helped Truman to be commander-in-chief in the final days of World War II and during the Korean conflict where he faced momentous decisions, including the first use of nuclear weapons and the removal of General Douglas MacArthur from command. President Truman was selected for induction by the Board of Governors of the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame in January of this year. The official party for today's Hall of Fame induction ceremony are Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy, Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center and Fort Leavenworth, and accepting on behalf of the late President Harry S. Truman, the oldest grandson of the President and First Lady Bess Truman, Mr. Clifton Truman Daniel. Please allow me to recognize our special guests in attendance today. We have the Honorable Mark Preisinger, Mayor, Leavenworth, Kansas. 
Lieutenant General Robert Arter, U.S. Army retired and Chairman Emeritus, CGSC Foundation. Lieutenant General Richard Keller, U.S. Army retired. Lieutenant General Perry Wiggins, U.S. Army retired and Executive Director of the Governor's Military Committee and Mrs. Wiggins. Mrs. Michael D. Lundy, spouse of the Commanding General United States Army Combined Arms Center and Fort Leavenworth. Command Sergeant Major Larry Smith, U.S. Army retired and past Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame inductee. Mr. Clyde Wendell, Chairman of the Truman Library Institute. Dr. Michael House, Senior Vice President, National World War I Museum and Memorial. Dr. Kurt Graham, Director of the Truman Library and Museum. United States Senate Liaisons, General Officers and Command Sergeants Major, members of the Senior Executive Service, members of the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame Selection Committee, and friends of the United States Army Combined Arms Center. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here today. It is now my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce the Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center, Lieutenant General Michael D. Lundy. Oh, good morning. Well, to all of our distinguished guests, again, thank you for being here today on a very cold day. And especially, I would like to thank Mr. Daniel for, for making the trip down from Chicago as we recognize President Truman. And when you think about this man, the man who probably had the toughest decisions of any man in our nation's history, if you think about the decisions that he had to make, uh, I, would, I would argue they probably were the toughest. This man, great character, great commitment, and certainly extraordinary competence, exemplifies everything that we think about when we aspire to be a leader. He came from humble beginnings, and he rose to the highest office of our nation and was faced with the most challenging decisions than any national leader could ever be faced with. During an extraordinary war, World War II, where the entire world was engulfed in flames, to have to make the decisions on how to end that, to the fight in Korea, and how to make very, very tough commander-in-chief decisions, the right kind of decisions that require extraordinary character and metal of heart. To be able to go on and continue to serve quietly as truly a servant leader. And as he started, and it's appropriate that this year in the centennial of the Great War, the war to end all wars, where President Truman served as an artilleryman, to be able to honor him this year is truly our honor. And it's for all of you, as you think today about what this means, what he meant to our nation, and what he means to all of us as leaders and what we need to aspire to, reflect on his service, reflect on his commitment, reflect on his character, because that is what we're about here as we think about being professionals, professionals of the arms. And President Truman certainly exemplified everything that we should all aspire to be. So with that, I would like to publish the orders to induct President Truman into the Hall of Fame of Fort Leavenworth. Please remain seated. Born in Lamar, Missouri on May 8, 1884, Harry S. Truman moved to Independence, Missouri with his family in 1890. In 1905, he enlisted in the Missouri National Guard and served until 1911. With American entry into the Great War in 1917, Truman returned to the National Guard and soon afterward was elected first lieutenant of his unit. During the war, he commanded Battery D, 129th Field Artillery, part of the 35th Division. Discharged as a major in May 1919, Truman was appointed to the Reserve Officer Corps in 1920. During the summer of 1923, he attended a two-week period of Reserve Officer training at Fort Leavenworth. Promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in 1925, Truman served with the 379th Field Artillery. After his promotion to Colonel in 1932, he assumed command of the regiment. In his civilian career, Truman was elected to represent Jackson County's Eastern District on the three-member county court in 1922. Although he lost his reelection bid in 1924, in 1926, he was elected presiding judge of Jackson County 
and initiated many improvements in the county's roads and public buildings. In 1933, while still serving as presiding judge, he became Missouri's director of the Federal Reemployment Program, a New Deal organization that brought him to the attention of Roosevelt administration officials. In 1934, Truman was elected as a U.S. Senator from Missouri and re-elected in 1940. When Roosevelt ran for a fourth term in 1944, the Democrats nominated Truman as his vice presidential running mate, and he was sworn into that office in January 1945. In April 1945, upon Roosevelt's death, Truman became the 33rd President of the United States. His presidency was both tumultuous and eventful. After the Japanese refusal to surrender, Truman authorized the deployment of the atomic bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1947, he signed a National Security Act merging the Departments of War and Navy and created the United States Air Force, in addition to establishing the National Security Council and the Central Intelligence Agency. In July 1948, he issued an executive order desegregating the U.S. Armed Forces. Truman was elected as president in his own right in November 1948, defeating Thomas Dewey in a surprise upset. A year and a half later, in June 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, and under the auspices of a UN resolution, the U.S. intervened. Truman also approved the containment of communism as U.S. policy and increased military spending as outlined in National Security Council paper number 68. In April 1951, Truman relieved General Douglas MacArthur as Commander-in-Chief, United Nations Command, for not respecting the authority of the presidency and replaced him with General Matthew Ridgway. After his presidency, Truman returned to independence and shunned all offers of corporate employment and commercial endorsements. He returned to Fort Leavenworth twice in 1961 and once in 1964 to speak at the CGSC graduation and to field questions from students. He died in Kansas City, Missouri on December 26, 1972 and was buried at the Truman Presidential Library and Museum. Service at Fort Leavenworth, Reserve Officer's Annual Training 1923, Guest Speaker 1961-1964. Lieutenant General Lundy and Mr. Clifton Truman Daniel will now unveil the shadow box that will be mounted in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Speaking on behalf of the late President Harry S. Truman, Mr. Clifton Truman Daniel. Thank you, General Lundy. Ladies and gentlemen, my grandfather would be very proud to be in such great company and in such a great location. Even as a child, he dreamed of a military career. Uh, during the Spanish-American War, he and some other teenagers formed their own rifle squad and marched back and forth across each other's backyards. He hoped that would get him into West Point. It did not. Uh, it was that. That didn't, it didn't help, and his eyesight was what kept him out. He had very bad eyesight. So he did, as you've heard, he joined the National Guard in 1905, was quickly promoted to corporal and quit in 1911 to help run the family farm and also coincidentally to court my grandmother, which could be a full-time job. Uh, one of the things he had to do in courting my grandmother was to flatten part of his farm fields to build her a tennis court. So there was a lot of work involved in, in courting my grandmother. He re-enlisted in 1917. He thought it was important that he fight. He didn't have to. He was 33 years old. He was the head of a household. He was a farmer. All of those things uh, would have legitimately kept him out of the war. Uh, and just coincidentally, he, he tried again to uh, enlist in uh, 1941 after Pearl Harbor. He went to General George Marshall, 
He was, at that, he was at this point a lieutenant colonel in the National Guard, and he went to General Marshall, and he said, I want to fight. And General Marshall said, you're too damn old. And my grandfather said, you're four years older than I am. And General Marshall smiled and said, yes, but I'm a general already. <laughs> so he didn't get to go in. World War I, in fighting in World War I, he learned some very important things about himself. He learned he could lead. And he learned that he had courage. Uh, the, first, uh, the first night, the first day that they fired on the German lines, the Germans, of course, eventually figured out where they were and drew a bead on them and started lobbing shells back. And one of my grandfather's sergeants and several of the men took off running. And Grandpa had to leave those guns in place and cover them up with branches, hide them, and get the rest of the men out of there. Went back for them later. But he wrote to my grandmother that, that he had stuck in place. He said his legs did not carry him off, although they badly wanted to. So he learned he could lead. He learned he had uh, courage. They called that afterwards, by the way. They, they titled that the Battle of Who Run. Uh, that's the sergeant and the men lost a few ranks after that one. He brought them all through the war in one piece, brought his whole battery through without a casualty. And afterwards, he he soured on post-war military service for a while. Uh, he once wrote to my grandmother that uh, anybody who uh, peacetime soldiering is an awful bore, and anybody who wants to do it is certainly off in his upper works. So he soured on it for a while, but he went back anyway. He, he enjoyed the camaraderie. And interestingly, both he and my grandmother viewed the summer encampments as a vacation from politics. He said at one point, he wrote to my grandmother while he was here at Leavenworth on uh, July 19, 1923, now, I'm going to have to write orders for a whole division today, and believe me, it's a real job. I won't have time to think of any politicians or jobs or roads for the balance of the week. So they looked at it as an escape for him. Uh, he was, and he, he was good at it. He enjoyed it. Not just the camaraderie, he enjoyed, he enjoyed the work. Uh, he had, after all, been elected in part because he was a veteran, an officer in the war, whose men hadn't wanted to shoot him. During his encampments during the summer, my, during their whole, their courtship and their marriage, my grandparents wrote more than a thousand letters to each other. The Truman Library owns 1,361 of my grandfather's letters to my grandmother, but only about 184 of my grandmother's back. And that's because my grandfather came home one day in 1955 around Christmas and he found my grandmother in front of a roaring fire burning her letters to him. And he stopped her and he said, you shouldn't do that. And she said, why not? You've read them, haven't you? <laughs> and he said, yes, but think of history. And she said, oh, I have. So those 184 survived, and I'm going to read you a few from 1923 when he was here at Leavenworth. They always wrote when they were apart, sometimes twice a day, often twice a day. And the first letter I actually, that I'm going to read is a bit from a letter from my grandmother wrote to him on uh, July 15 and 16, 1923, just to show you that there was uh, courage on the home front as well. She said, it is now 1020 and I am in bed. There was a big black bug on my bed when I turned the sheet down, and I had to kill it myself. So you see the sacrifices that they make at home when, when you guys go off. Uh, on July 16, Grandpa had a habit of when he wrote these letters, he, he described everything to my grandmother. It's a, I mean, I had to cut, in, in, in putting together this book, I had to cut out huge chunks because he would report on every little thing he did during the day. But just to give you some idea, July 16, 1923, I got up at 5.30, went down to the end of the street in my pajamas and took a cold shower, ran back, dressed, and was ready for breakfast at 6.30. We had half a grapefruit, cream of wheat, ham, two eggs, two hotcakes, and coffee, and I ate it all, which prompted my grandmother to reply the next day, that was some breakfast. You'll have to be plenty strenuous to keep that front down. Here's another one. This is from July 18th, and he's referring to the PT, physical training that they, that they put them through, which apparently in his regular life as a politician, he didn't have to get up every morning and do push-ups and sit-ups. 
Uh, we get up officially at 5.45, but I get up at 5.15. I shaved this morning, then fell in for bendovers, and they are real ones. I want to tell you, I expect to be as sore as a mule in wartime before I get hardened to it. Yesterday, we had to carry a small four-legged stool about a quarter of a mile and sit on it. Listening to lectures on map reading, combat orders, a speech by General Smith, the mayor of Leavenworth, president of the Chamber of Commerce, and the representative of the Secretary of War. They call us the Milkmaid's Brigade, the Stool Pigeons, and other vile and ribald names. And by they, I mean the medicos and others who don't have to carry the stools. And I, this one is just, this one is specifically for Leavenworth and for Kansas. Uh, he wrote this on July 19th, 1923. Well, we are in the middle of a great war between Kansas and Missouri, and the mean part about it is that I am in the Kansas Army and am helping to lick my own people and doing a good job of it. <laughs> and finally, on July 21st, 1923, he, I think, gives my grandmother a, a, a thorough but an explanation of why he had gone back into peacetime, peacetime soldiering after the war. You perhaps can see something of the pull there is on a man when he's had some military training to do it again. There is no explanation for it, but it's there. He'll cuss the military and all that pertains to it, and then he'll go right back and take more punishment. There is something about it that's not to be explained by reason or common sense any more than why a man loves his wife. We are a bunch of nuts and can't help it, I guess, but we enjoy it. And you can see that I am not the only one affected. You heard a little bit about how being in the military informed my uh, grandfather's presidency, and I think that's very true. And one thing that occurred to me is that having been in war, having been a fighting man, uh, he learned some lessons sort of in the other direction. Um, at the end of World War I, he was as much for punishing Germany as anybody else, which, as you all know, is what ultimately happened. On October 30th, 1918, he wrote to my grandmother, I'm for peace, but that gang, the Germans, should be given a bayonet piece and be made to pay for what they've done to France. And on November 11th, 1918, Armistice Day, he wrote to my grandmother, it's a shame we can't go in and devastate Germany and cut off a few of the Dutch kids' hands and feet and scalp a few of their old men. But I guess it would be better to make them work for France and Belgium for 50 years. So he had been every bit as angry as everyone else, but by the time the World War II ended, he had learned from that attitude and gave us the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding of Europe, he and General Marshall. And I, of course, I believe you heard, we had a little discussion of the atomic bombings, and I believe very strongly that, that having been among soldiers having fought, uh, he, that figured very, very significantly in his decision. But his concern for fighting men and women came after World War II in Korea, which he said himself was the most difficult set of decisions that he ever had to make. Uh, he got a letter after he left the presidency. He received a letter from a William Banning of New Canaan, Connecticut. And this letter is on display at the Truman Library today. Uh, PFC George Banning, Mr. Banning's son, had been killed in Korea on May 11th in 1953, just a week shy of his 22nd birthday. And in a letter to my grandfather, the senior Mr. Banning enclosed his son's purple heart. And he wrote, Mr. Truman, since you have been directly responsible for the loss of our son's life in Korea, you might just as well keep this emblem on display in your trophy room as a memory of one of your historic deeds. Our major regret at this time is that your daughter was not there to receive the same treatment as our son received in Korea. My grandfather died December 26, 1972, and in early 1973, when the archivists were going through his office, they found the Banning letter and that purple heart in his upper right-hand desk drawer. He had kept it there for 20 years to remind him of the cost, the terrible cost, of sending young men and women into war. So again, thank you for this honor. He would be proud to be in your company. He cared, he cared a great deal about military service in this country and about fighting men and women.
and you can do him no greater honor than to include him among your number. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the Army song and remain standing for the departure of the official party. There is a receiving line in the atrium. We ask our distinguished guests to please use the exit door to your left front and follow the Commander in Chief's hallway to the atrium. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>